So I told you, take a deep seat. This is going to get a 20. One of my favorite authors, Linda Lell Miller, the book High Country Bride. It's the McKettrick Cowboys. And let me just put on my readers so we can really hit this book good and hard with all the paper clips. This was one of my favorite books, one of these, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? I couldn't put it down. I wanted to know. And if they ever put this in a, in a movie form, the, this McKettrick series, I would be probably the first one to watch it. And I think that Ryan Pavey would be a great Rafe McKettrick. Just saying. Okay, anyway. The number one New York be Times bestseller author, L Linda Lale Miller, delights with her classic series featuring the three McKettrick brothers who founded a dynasty on the western front frontier. Tired of waiting, Arizona Territory rancher Angus McKettrick ordains the first son to marry to produce a grandchild would in inherit the ranch. And with three equally determined cowboys searching for brides, the sparks are sure to fly. Rafe McKettrick loves one thing more than his freedom, and that's the Triple M Ranch. In his bid to win it, he marries a woman and he's never met. To his surprise, Emmeline is as beautiful as she is spirited, but she's clearly hiding a secret. Emmeline Harding discovered she couldn't hold her liquor the hard way. Certain when she woke up, why she woke up to a stack of gold coins in a brothel, and fearing the worst, she fled town as a mail order bride. Now she must confess her past to her handsome new husband. The newlyweds are still circling each other suspiciously when a visitor from the past enters the high country. Can Rafe and Emmeline give up on marriage and name only and seek a union that satisfies them body and soul? A winding, winsome romance full of likable, if occasional, pig-headed characters, Publishers Weekly said. Now, let's share this with you, shall we? Like I said, this was one of my all-time favorites. Um, I felt like I'd never read this before, but it was a page-turner and some really good moments to share with you. So let's get to cracking. Page three. Yeah, already we got a paper clip. Angus laid a hand on the angel's foot, ruminating. It's past time those lads of ours had done with this carousing got themselves settled down. I'm thinking, he said when he got in all his maverick thoughts rounded up and herded in the same direction. Our Rafe, is, he's turning it 30 this June, and he's nothing but a rascal brawling in the saloons and chasing women. Thinks there's only one opinion in the world that matters, and that's his own. Why, he spent half the winter in and out of jail. And Cade's no better. He just plays cards closer to the vest, that's all. As for Jeb, he paused, shook his head. That young un is good looking as the devil before the fall, wild as a mustang and ornery as a three legged mule. I was too easy on em, Georgia. I listened to you and never laid a hand on one of em. But now I see that I should have taken a strap to their hides once in a while. Yes, indeed. They might have been worth something today if I hauled them off to the woodshed now and again, the way my pa did me. Now, that's Angus McKettrick talking to his late wife's tombstone, Georgia's tombstone. And you notice it's so easy for everybody to go there and just vent either their frustrations or what's wrong. But yet, when they were living, and they could have a living, breathing conversation, not just one-sided, it's rare that this guy didn't bare his soul to his wife then, when he had the chance. Okay, so on page 14, we learn that Rafe is writing a letter here to, um, let's see here, the Cattleman's Journal had an advertisement, and it was for, to whom it may concern, please send me one wife, healthy with good teeth, able to read and write and cook, must want children soon, Rafe McKettrick, the Triple M Ranch, near the Indian Rock, Arizona Territory. He read the note over, drafted on the bank in town, nothing to do but slap on a stamp and mail the letter on to the stagecoach headed west, to the happy 
home matrimonial service right there on the front of the envelope for everybody to see and let alone was fodder enough for the merciless ribbing that every and every other man on the ranch for another he didn't want any of his brothers to beat him to the punch by swiping his copy or his idea or even both we're going to move forward to page 48 that's a big jump in it Rafe cursed. He sent for a wife nearly two months before he'd forgotten all about her. These peop uh, The least these people at the happy home matrimonial service could have done was notify him that they filled his order. Come back, come on back here and fight, Jake said, swinging both legs over the edge of the table and promptly crumpling the sawdust to the floor. Rafe peeled a cuff, cup. I can't talk tonight, sorry. Rafe peeled off a couple of bills and thrust them at Jake's partner, Pooty Callahan. Get him over to the doc's office, he said, distracted. Then he turned and hurried out the saloon. He was halfway to the livery stables when he realized he couldn't ride after his bride looking the way he did. He was filthy. His clothes were torn, bloody, and he needed barbering. He made a hell of a first impression as it was. She was a city girl, most likely, and if he didn't take time to clean up a little bit, he'd scare the devil out of her. No, sir, everything was riding on this, and he had to handle it right. Okay, page 87. And I don't like when I mark the page and I don't mark... Why did I mark it? Oh, now I see why. Um, instead, he reached into the pocket of his coat and brought out a small packet of fo folded paper. His big rancher fingers fumbled a little as he opened it to show the, her the contents. Two gold wedding bands glimmered inside, almost lost in its, the width and the breadth of his gold, leather glove palm. Emmeline looked at the rings and then up at Rafe. He held out his hand a little farther. Take it, he said. Then, with a slight notion of his arm to prompt her, the little one's yours. She smiled at the clarification, and he chuckled, though he reddened a little bit at the base of his jaw, and his expression had an element of shyness about it. She took the ring, held it between her thumb and forefinger, and turned it slightly, enjoying the cool smoothness, its glow. Rafe, meanwhile, made some shifting motions, pulling off his riding gloves and then jamming them into his coat pocket like a carnival magician, ma magician before... I'll say it in a minute. Magician performing sleight of the hand, he managed to end up with his band lying in his palm. He hooked it onto his little finger and then took both her hands and his. We've got a lot of things to work through, he said huskily, but in the meantime, will you wear my ring? She felt something tighten in, his, in her throat, sweet and spiky pain, and could only nod her head, even though good sense told her to refuse until she was sure she wanted to stay on the triple M. His big hands were trembling, and Rafe slipped her ring onto her finger. Emmeline was moved, as if they'd been standing in a cathedral, clad in their finest wedding garb instead of on a towering hill, buffeted an ever-chiller breeze. Without ado, she took Rafe's ring in his left hand and pushed the band onto his finger. The two of them just stood there, then their hands still clasped, unable to meet each other's eyes. Well... Rafe said finally in a husky voice, I reckon I ought to kiss you to seal the bargain and all. She couldn't answer, but she just stood there inside Conception's coat, miserable with hope. Rafe put a finger under his, her chin, raised her face so that she had to look right at him. She did so, and her gaze held steady despite her many misgivings and uncertainties. The forbidden night she'd spent with a man called Holt back in Kansas City tugged at the hem of her conscience, and a sense of sorrow settled over her quieting her joy. Okay, page 90. She thought of that Texan again, and shadow resting across her heart length, and she needed to tell Rafe what happened to get it off her conscious. Rafe! He turned that indigo gaze onto the solemn and patient waiting for her to continue. She stared at him, and something turned over in the most fragile part of her spirit, doing damage, leaving a web of fine cracks behind. She looked away, made herself look back. Are you sorry you sent for me? On page 91, he touched her cheek with the back of his fingers ever so gently. Are you sorry you came, he countered. She considered the matter, then shook her head. No, she said, but I don't know if I'm glad either. He smiled at that. Fair enough, he said, then reached for the canteen and the saddlebags preparing to leave. What I like most about these two is 
they are always making the other one guess where they stand. They never really know. And it's a push and shove like two magnets. So therefore, if you have one pushing, one needs to be kind of pulling away yet drawn together quickly. And they have that yin and yang. It's just inside this relationship so heavily. Page 105. Emmeline realized that her eyes had gone wide and she willed herself to relax. I was only trying to be a good ranch wife, she confided. Conception chuckled. I think your idea of being a wife might be a little different than from Rafe's, she said. The water in the tea kettle began to boil and she poured it into the crockery pot, raising a cloud of deliciously scented steam. When Rafe sent away for a bride, he expected someone who would follow his orders, cook his meals, clean his house, and bear his children. She paused. What did you expect, Emmeline? She shrugged, feeling dispirited and exceedingly far from home. I guess I wanted to belong somewhere, she said. Conception patted her Emmeline's shoulder, then took two cups from the shelf next to the sink. She inclined her head slightly, urging Emmeline toward the table, and they both sat down on opposite sides, the teapot between the two of them. What did they talk about? You gotta read the book to find out. And it's worth reading the book because uh, Concepcion is the uh, maid of the house, if you will, but yet she has a relationship with Angus, the father of the boys. It's all complicated. It's all tied together so beautifully and masterfully. All you have to do is read this great book. I'm trying to wet your whistle so that you do that. Page 154. My own child. Now it was Emmeline's turn to be stunned. She had considered the possibility before, of course, but always dismissed it. It was as if the sky and the earth had just changed places. Nothing whether Rafe ever learned what she'd done or not would have ever been the same. She put one hand to her mouth. I didn't plan on to tell you this way, Becky said. Her usually straight shoulders were swooping a little. She met em Emmeline's gaze steadily, even proudly, but with a sheen of tears glimmering in her eyes. Not so bluntly in any case, but now I've said it. There's no turning back. You're my child, Emmeline. Emmeline hardly asked, dared ask my father. Becky smiled sadly. Charles T. Fairmont the Third, she said. I get a small measure of satisfaction out of using his name, whether... I need an alias, as you know. I, he was a business associate of your grandfather's, a sophisticated older man, very charming and handsome. I thought he would marry me when I told him about you, she sighed for a moment. An old grief shadowed her eyes. I was wrong. He had already married someone else, and of course he promptly denied any involvement with me. My father pronounced me a trollop and threw me out on the house of good. Stricken to silence, Emmeline could only stare at the other woman, her mother. On the other, one hand, she felt pity for the long ago girl, frightened and spun by her family as well as her lover. She had made some terrible choices in order to get, make a home for herself and for Emmeline. On the other hand, Emmeline resented bitterly all the years she'd been led to believe that she was an orphan. You kept your secret for so long, Emmeline managed. After some time passed, she asked why. And to get the answer to that question, you're going to have to read on page 165. Becky, which is her mom, but yet she's told everybody is her aunt because that's what she thinks. That she, Becky has told her all along she's not hers, that she's the aunt. So now it's getting even more deeper. See how it all ties together? Becky took a sip from her cup, made a face, and added coarse brown sugar from the bowl in the center of the table. A fly blundered repeatedly against the glass in the window beside their table. That you're my daughter, you mean. Well, as I said it before, it did occur to me that you might be less than delighted to discover that you had a lady of the evening for the mother. Emmeline lowered her eyes for a moment, then made herself look meet Becky's gaze. What now? she asked. Becky arched one eyebrow. What now? She repeated, it's simple, Emmeline. You go on with your life and I go on with mine. It's not as easy as that, Emmeline whispered. If Rafe ever finds out, if you're smart, Becky said, salting her meatloaf with a liberal hand, you won't tell him. Men are such hypocrites when it comes to this sort of thing. They sure don't mind indulging now and again, but bring a lady of the evening into the family and they have a conniption fit. Emmeline shuddered. She was beginning to feel ill again. She pushed that meatloaf away. You're not thinking about telling Rafe about that night in Kansas City, Becky asked. That would be a damned fool thing to do. 
No, Emmeline said wholly miserably on the, at every level of her being. I've thought about it. I hate living a lie, but I'm afraid. Have you and he consummated your marriage? Emmeline reddened. Yes, she whispered. And he didn't come in afterward? She shook her head. Then what's worrying you? You look as though you're about to leap right through your skin. Emmeline lowered her voice still further, even if somebody was listening at the kitchen door. However, they were much too far away to overhear. I haven't had my monthly since, well, since before, she admitted. Before Kansas City, I mean. Becky set her fork down with a thunk, the meatloaf forgotten. Oh, my stars. Emmeline bit her lip. I was never very regular anyway, she lament, said lament, lamely. But you might be pregnant. The word struck Emmeline like an arrow to the heart. She couldn't answer. She couldn't even nod. Well, now, Becky said Lamently dryly, it seems like things are never so bad that they can't get worse. Or can they? Page 184. Then you won't mind explaining, Emmeline said. Conception bent her li lower lip with an enormous sigh. Madre de Dios, she murmured and crossed herself that her lips continued to move, but silently for a few moments, and then reluctantly went, went, she went on. It is just that Mr. McKettrick, Angus, wants grandkids, very much. He's been feeling his age, worrying that he would die without ever seeing his sons married with families of their own, so he, he sort of helped things along. How? Emmeline asked very quietly. Becky, though listening intently, said nothing. It was his birthday, Conception said, looking worried. He was melancholy. He told Rafe, Cade, and Jeb that he would give control of the ranch to whoever of, of them married first and gave him a grandchild. Emmeline had known all along, of course, that her marriage to Rafe was not a love match and that he made it perfectly clear that he wanted a child right away. But it wounded her. Just the same, to realize he hadn't made the decision to take a wife on his own violation. She was a means to an end to him, a convenience, and probably a little more. He would have married anybody because he needed a wife and to get a child and control of the Triple M. I see, she said to no one in particular. No, Conception argued under her breath. I don't think you see it all. Rafe cares for you in time. In time, Emmeline echoed, standing up. She's just tired, Becky said hastily, rising to perhaps a short rest. Emmeline shook, off, shook her off. Let, please let me be, she said very softly, both of you. Ooh, what's going to happen there, right? You gotta read the book. Page 195. She pretended to be busy wiping down the already spotless table. Tell me, Mr. McKettrick, she said, would you have sent away for a wife if the Triple M hadn't been at stake? He was quiet for a long time. And she couldn't bring him himself. She couldn't bring himself to look at him. Probably not, he said finally. You would have gone on carousing and drinking and fighting and chasing saloon women forever, I suppose. She said, "Not forever," he said miser miserably. For a while longer, though, I reckon. At least he was honest. Emmeline thought that was more than she could get say for herself. She had to get down off her high horse difficult as that may, would be, and make the best of things. She was married, and she had a real home, and in time would surely be children. It was everything she wanted, everything she'd hoped for, saved on. Perhaps it would be asking too much to expect love as well. At this point, she wasn't sure that true article even existed outside of fairy tales and her silly dreams. I want to thank you, Rafe, she said quietly. He looked at her startled. Thank me? Yes, she replied. You've been so kind to me and patient. Are you, well, over that other thing? She smiled at his embarrassment. Not for a few more days yet, she said. I reckon you must be worn out. Maybe you better turn in. I want to have a word with Paul, and then I'll be up. She nodded, went to him, stood on tiptoe to kiss his cheek, and then without another word, she climbed the back stairs and made her way along the corridor to their room. He gave her plenty of time to change into her nightdress, brush her teeth, and get into bed before tapping lightly on the door and waiting for her to answer. He stood shyly on the threshold for a few moments, then came into the room, closing the door behind him. I brought you this, he said shyly, and handed her a brick wrapped in felt. Okay. We find out that her mom buys the hotel that the father owns. 
mainly because the father never did anything for the hotel that he bought. It was just a good investment. And the mom, or aunt, if you will, traveled all the way from Kansas City to come see her daughter to make sure she was doing okay and decided that she needed to buy the hotel after all. Page 200. Now, this is the conversation between mother and daughter. I wouldn't think of accepting a cent, Emmeline said, because the money is tainted, Becky asked, and for the first time Emmeline realized Becky's greatest vulnerability, always independent, always thumbing her nose at the scornful matrons of Kansas City Upper Crust. Becky wanted, perhaps ne even needed, Emmeline's respect and approval. Money, Emmeline said, stitching even more busily than before, is money. You've obviously saved and invested wisely over the year. I'm refusing to accept any of it because I'm a grown woman now and married, and I should be an asset to you, not a liability. Pride glittered in Becky's eyes. My girl, you've never been a liability to me, not now, not ever. You were and you are the greatest joy of my life, and my money means to me nothing to me at all if I can't share it with you. Emmeline was moved, unable for that moment to speak or so. She knew then for the full extent of Becky's sacrifice. She had prostituted herself and established one of the best-known brothels in Kansas City for her. The knowledge left Emmeline breathless. Moving on. 208. All what, he asked very quietly. Are you telling me you're happy here, Emmeline, on the Triple M, I mean with me? She flushed, lowered her eyes, and suddenly she was desperate to know. What about you, Rafe? Are you happy? See, there's that yin and yang again. He bent his head, tasting her mouth in a teasing way that sent sweet shivers through her. Yes, he said, putting a lusty emphasis on that word. They drove on. Emmeline, painfully conscious of all the wicked forces Rafe had so easily aroused in her, Rafe smiling, keeping his thoughts to himself. Just ahead, the track converged with another newer trail snaking up the mountainside from a direction of Indian Rock. When they finally reached the, the site where their home would be built, Emmeline felt a rush of excitement. Stacks of massive, cleanly plain logs had been brought in. Some of them notched at the ends so they could be fitted together into sturdy walls, strong enough to keep out the worst weather. Oh, Rafe, Emmeline whispered, clasping her hands together. You've begun building. He looked pleased and uncharacteristically modest. Not exactly. All we've done so far is brought the logs in. They were cut and milled up around Flagstaff. He drew, he drew the team to a halt, set the brake lever, and secured the reins, then took a moment to access the construction project with the obvious pride. Paul said he came in to some unexpected money the other day, and the logs are his wedding gift to us, along with the land itself, of course. Emmeline's spirits soared. She stood up in the wagon box in order to see farther, and drew in a deep breath, spreading her arms wide. It was easy to imagine the finished house sturdy and strong, a frontier castle with smoke coming from its chimney, and the lights glowing in the windows. "'I wish we could stay,' she said, not even to go back, but just stay right here, you and me in our house under our own roof. "'Sounds like things are going great. Or are they?' Page 261. I told you I was married once and widowed before I met Georgia, he went on. What I didn't say was we had a child together. I had a boy called Holt. After her mother's folks, I was young, and when my wife died, sometimes the grief was so bad I'd ride out onto the countryside and just holler, till I was too hoarse to keep it up. I commenced to drink and more and than I should have, too, and I was itching to leave that place behind me. I guess I thought I could outrun the pain some way. The boy's aunt finally convinced me that I ought to leave the boy with her and her husband until I got myself straightened out. It didn't have to be permanent, she told me, just until I could give hold a proper home and all. Conception, which is the maid, remember, came to sit on the side of the bed when he stopped to recover for a moment. She took his big hand in her two small ones and kissed the knuckles. But it was permanent, she said softly. He nodded. I was a long time getting myself headed in the right direction, he said. Holt's aunt uncle asked me to let them adopt him, and I agreed. It seemed like the best thing to do at the time, but I always regretted it. 
Georgia would have been glad to take my son in and raise him like her own. Yes, Conception said, smiling. She would have. She was a wonderful woman, your Georgia. By the time we were married and had the ranch turn into a steady profit, it was too late. Holt was somebody else's son by then. He swallowed hard, searching for Conception's face for any trace of condemnation. He felt for himself and only saw tenderness there, only warmth and compassion. I don't know how much of about what his life was like, but I believe it was a hard one. Oh, Angus, Conception said softly, touching his face. I should have gone back there, Conception. I should have made sure Holt was all right. Damn it, he's my own flesh and blood. She kissed his forehead, touched his index finger to his mouth. You had every reason to believe he was safe, she said, and you were more than a thousand miles away, building a ranch, starting a new family. You couldn't have traveled to Texas without, without causing a hardship for Mrs. McKettrick and the boys as well as yourself. He closed his eyes and sighed. She was a balm to his spirit, this woman, simple, practical, sweet, and he began to let go muscle by muscle, thought by thought, breath by breath of all of his burden. In time he slept and dreamed that Conception was chasing that devil around the front yard with a fireplace poker, railing him in Spanish. And if you read the book, you'll know exactly what that is all about, and they have a cute relationship, Angus and Conception. Page 274. When Emmeline closed the door behind her, he smiled as though he'd been expecting her. What do you mean? she demanded, in a frantic whisper by blood relative. She saw the mischievous light in his eyes that, seen in Jebs on several occasions since her arrival in Indian Rock, and she waited. Suppose I told you that your husband is my half-brother, he said. She was sure she'd faint, just slide down that door into a heap on the floor. You can't be. I am, though. I'm Angus McKettrick's eldest son, left behind in Texas right after I was born. He paused, watching the color drain from her face, his own features void from any emotion at all. I wouldn't say anything right away if I were you, though, he added. I believe Angus wants to speak with my half-brothers himself. It seems they don't know about me, either. Emmeline put a hand to her throat. It was bad enough that she'd been indiscreet with this man. Worse, that, she even that he'd turned up on the Triple M. But the fact that he and Rafe were brothers was downright calamitous. Even if he managed to overlook what he she'd done and decided to expose her for a harlot, her husband would be remedied of her mistake every time he looked at Holt Cavanaugh, and that brought poison to whatever portion of love, trust, fate, might allot them. Emmeline... She straightened her, patted her hair with one hand, waited miserably for him to go on. She would need every ounce of dignity she, she possessed in days to come, and whatever she feign as well. Yes? She asked very crisply. I wonder if you would read to me for a while, he said, surprising her. I could use something to take my mind off this leg. She hesitated, then knowing she couldn't refuse, and not really wanting to, Odd as that may seem, she nodded. I'll find something in Agus's study, she said, groping behind her back for the do doorknob. Thank you, Lola, Holt said. I'm obliged. Now, if you read the book, you'll find out why Holt called her Lo Lola. There's a story behind that. Page 278 to 279. We're getting there. Halfway. He swore, but under his breath, Conception, after all, a lady. Have you known my father long, he asked. Yes, she said in a quiet voice. I came to work in this house when my husband was murdered. The boys were small then, and Mrs. K McKettrick was still living. Holt was glad that he hadn't known about Angus's second family when he was young. He'd been a hot-headed kid in trouble more than oftentimes than not. Most likely he'd have been eaten alive by his own jealousy, and it was he had trouble warming up to Rafe, Cade, and Jeb. I'm sorry about your husband, he said after some time. A delicious numbness was beginning to creep through his system. So am I, Conception replied. Manuel was a good man. She stood up and starting to pull out his bandages again. It hurt like hell. That part hadn't changed, but thanks to a landrum and morphine, he didn't give a damn. She removed the dressings, set them aside, and left the room, returning a few minutes later with a bottle of clean rags and more bandages already torn into strips. The stuff in the bottle that felt like horse liniment on the ravaged flesh, and he damn near bit through his lower lip again, like he'd done on the mountain right after the accident. Sweet God, he muttered. She paused, 
looked across herself, but was smiling a little. You're very much like your father, she said, and she sounded almost fond. Under these circumstances, he might have taken issue with that statement, scorning any comparison to himself and the man that trained himself to be despised, but he was just plain didn't have the strength at the moment. How's that, he ground out. You are born stubborn. For you, that quality is both a blessing and a curse. You will succeed at anything and if you attempt because you don't know how to give up, even when you, it would be the best for all concerned. But you will also suffer more than you need to because you cannot ask another person for help. Hope, Holt waited for her to finish her work. Only when she stopped cleaning his wound and started replacing the bandages she removed, working carefully around the improvised split, did he realize that he began holding his breath for the most of that time. He drew in a gulp of air. Do you think you could eat something, she asked as she went to the window and raised the sash a little way. He always sent, had nothing since the soup Emmeline brought, but he didn't feel hungry. I don't feel like anything, Conception came to his bedside. I didn't ask what you wanted, she said reasonably. I asked if you could take food. You can ex expect to get well if you don't. You can't expect to get well if you don't eat. He sighed. All right, he said. He definitely wanted to get well, the sooner the better, and now that he had a look at the old man and found out that he didn't have ho horns and hooves and a pointy tail, he was ready to make some new plans. Maybe he'd hit the trail again. I'll bring you some of that pudding Emmeline made for supper, Conception said, and then maybe not. Okay, page 284 to 285, it looks like. Angus nodded. She did, he confirmed. She wanted me to tell the three of you right along, but I guess I was ashamed of leaving my own flesh and blood behind for somebody else to raise. Then when your mother died, well, you all were still boys, and I didn't want any of you thinking about that, that I was about to abandon you the way I did your brother. I reckon this changes things, Rafe said. He wasn't sure what he felt concerning Angus's long-standing lie of mission, but one fact troubled him greatly. He was no longer the firstborn son. Page 288 and 289. Turns out Pa's been keeping a hell of a big secret, he said. She waited. They stopped, the two of them, their arms full of clean laundry, the deep grass rippling around them, their feet in the evening breeze. Rafe tilted his head back, searched the sky, and finally met Emmeline's gaze. It seems that stranger sleeping up in the spare room isn't a stranger after all, he told her at some length. Holt Cavanaugh was born Holt McKettrick. He's my half-brother to the rest of us. Emmeline looked stricken, but not precisely surprised, though Rafe didn't take any special notice right then. Then that's why Jeb is so angry, Rafe nodded. You can't let him go. What if something happens? What if he never comes back? He heaved aside. I can't stop him from leaving, Emmeline. The fact is, right this minute, I'd probably ride out myself if, I, if it weren't for you. You would? You would just leave? He thrust a hand through his hair. Sometimes that's the only way a man can sort through things. Just then, Jeb got on his horse out to the barn and handed an armload of sheets to Emmeline and strode over to his brother. He put a hand on Jeb's arm, something he would have known better to do if he hadn't been so distracted by Emmeline's presence. Jeb whirled around and landed a haymaker right there in the middle of Rafe's belly. The wind knocked out of him, but he didn't let go down. What the hell was that for? He gasped. And he could talk, and he sensed Emmeline's hovering somewhere. He sensed Emmeline was hovering somewhere close by, and he didn't like knowing that she'd seen somebody get the better of him like that. Turn to know what happens next. Read the book. Okay. Page 294 to 295. Truth to tell. Holt wasn't ready for all that concern about his half-brother's hurt feelings, not at the moment, anyway. His leg felt like it had been beaten to a mash with a sledgehammer and then set on fire. The walls of that bedroom were closing in on him, inch by inch. The one bright spot was that sweet little Emmeline, damned if she wasn't married to the son and heir. He smiled his private smile. You'll forgive me, Mr. McKettrick, he said, if I don't wax a cinnamon over my brother's in sad plight. After all, Rafe, Cade, and Jeb had enjoyed the luxuries of a fine home, a birthright, and a family. If they had to do some fancy thinking now, well, so be it. There are bound to be some hard feelings, Inga said. He cleared his throat, glancing at Conception, probably seeking courage as he went on. It'll take time for everybody to come to terms with the situation. Still, you're the bone and flesh of my flesh, and there's a place for you, Holt, right here on the Triple M. 
Holt already held already weighed the meaning of the ranch's name in his mind, already having little else to do but stare at the ceiling and grit his teeth against the pane. He was planning on passing the morning ahead by counting leaves on the oak tree outside his window. The triple M, he reflected out loud. I reckon that's a reference to your three sons. He put the slightest emphasis on the word three. Yes, Angus said, leaning forward, that's what it means. But a name is just that, a name. Do you mean to stay on and when your leg heals up or not? To find that answer out, you got to read on. Page 316 to page 317. She reddened. If you mean to tell Rafe about us, she asked hoarsely, then why don't you just go ahead and do it? Ah, he said, but that's my trump card. What would I do for entertainment once it was played? He paused and sighed. Just then the door swung open, fairly stopping Emmeline's heart in mid-beat, and Rafe strolled in. His expression was so fierce. For one terrible moment she thought that he found out somewhat, somehow about her and Holt. Rafe went to stand at the foot of the bed, his arms folded. Pa tells me you bought the Chandelier place, he said. Emmeline laid a hand to her chest and he tri tried to breathe. She stared at Holt, a plea in her eyes. He merely smiled and shifted his gaze to Rafe. That's right, Holt told Rafe. I'd sell it right price, though. Are you interested? Just what in the hell are you trying to do, Rafe countered. Put us out of business, start a range war. Emmeline's blood ran cold at the mere mention of a range war. She read about such conflicts in the newspapers back home, and by all accounts, they were brutal. They were affairs of uh, serving no one in the end. Holt was the absolute version of innocence. Now, why would I want to do that, he asked, spreading his hands. Pure spite, maybe, Rafe said. My buying the Chandelier place could put you out of business, he reflected, standing intrigued. I hadn't thought of it that way. Hell no, Rafe growled a little bit too late. But you just said, Rafe shoved a hand through his hair. Look, he said, you leave the springs alone and you keep your kettle off the grass and there doesn't have to be any trouble. I thought you believed in open range, Holt said. Isn't that what you burned at the Pelton cabin and took back the land? It wasn't like that, Rafe snapped. Wasn't it, Holt asked. Rafe gripped the foot of the bed rail so tightly that his knuckles turned white. When did you say you'd be well enough to move on? You want to know the answer to that? Read the book. On page 366 to 367. Before I told him, he demanded, looking a lot like Rafe in that light or the lack of it. Damn it, Emmeline, there was nothing to tell. You put on somebody else's clothes. You got drunk. I didn't want to tell Becky what you were up to, and I didn't want to leave you for one of the other men to take advantage of. So I put you to bed and left. That was the end of it. Emmeline's mouth dropped open. But those coins, I thought maybe you needed money and that you were in some kind of trouble and desperate. Emmeline sat down again. She felt as though she might throw up or even faint. Emmeline, I thought we, that you and I, Jesus, he murmured. Then he turned and star stared away at started away from her, stumping determinedly toward the barn. "'Where are you going?' Emmeline cried, at last finding the strength to break her strange inertia and move away from her feet. "'None of your damn business,' he called back. She hurried after him, tried to take hold of his arm. "'You can't,' she said quickly. "'Holt, you can't. You're hurt if you ride.' "'Stay out of this,' Holt said, tersely shaking her off. "'You've already done enough damage as it is. There were almost, "'They were almost to the barn. Don't go, Rafe.' "'Don't go after Rafe,' she pleaded. "'He'll kill you, or you'll hurt him, "'but nothing good will come of it.' "'His eyes were hot. "'Go in the house, Emmeline.' "'She stood speechless, "'with one hand clasped over her mouth, "'staring after him, "'and as he stormed off into the barn, "'he managed to saddle a horse, "'put the bridle in place, "'and even mount without any help. "'Emmeline was still standing where he left her "'when he came riding out in the moonlight on the ground. "'He was crippled in the saddle, "'but he was his old self.' At least let me go with you, she cried. He paused beside her, reining in a practice gelding, and got in one last valley. Oh, you'd be a lot of help, he scoffed furiously. You've already made enough trouble to keep us all busy for the next hundred years, picking up all the pieces. With that, he rode away. And that was page 368. Page 370. Rafe was drunk and out of his mind with sorrow. Listen to me, he said. You go to hell, Rafe responded. Damn you, Holt, and damn her. Holt's face tightened. He dearly lost his balance, using both hands to shove Rafe backward onto his 
but remarkably he caught his crutch before it fell and jammed it back underneath his arm breathing hard as he leaned on it and gazed down at Rafe there's a real good chance that I'll go to hell someday Holt said breathing hard and fast but it won't be because of anything I did with Emmeline Rafe tried to stand but he was winded and he wanted to come up swinging he wiped his mouth and with the back of his hand she told me what happened he said get up you damn fool she told you what she thought happened Rafe rose, dusting himself off, trying to decide whether or not to be justified in sucker-pinching his half-brother. She said she spent the night with you and you gave her money for it, she said. It made him sick, the picture of what came to mind, and he felt the heat had heard the roar of the fire behind him, consuming his dreams. She was drunk that night, Holt said, eyes flashing with reflected light of the fire and the fury. I didn't touch her except to take her shoes and that stupid outfit off she had on. Paid her, yes, because I figured she must be hard up for money to pull a stupid stunt like that. It's amazing, isn't it? She tells him what she thinks happened, but yet in reality it didn't happen. So he's got the worst impression of her. When his half-brother goes to set the record straight, he'd rather believe what Emmeline told him that puts her in ill light with him. This is why I love this book, because it's so deep, and it makes you think, and it makes you go, if you hold a grudge long enough, you may lose everything. Page 377. Becky shook a finger at her. I warned you, Emmeline. I told you that Rafe wouldn't understand. Emmeline lowered her head, but only for a moment. Then she was looking directly into Becky's eyes again. I had no other choice, she said. Oh, indeed, Becky ran in an outraged whisper, well aware, as Emmeline was, that Clive was probably just outside the room with one ear to the keyhole. Well, my dear, you just haven't finished off your own reputation in this town. You've put an end to mine as well, lacking your penchant it for spoiling a good thing. Excuse me. I had planned on making a fresh new start, she sighed, an expression th thoughtful for now, but once word gets around, that may be a different, difficult thing to do. I do regret that part of it truly, Emmeline said with feeling. It's just I couldn't think of a way to clear the air with Rafe without revealing how I came to be in such a situation in the first place. Therefore, I had to tell him that I grew up in the brothel, and naturally that meant... What did that mean? Read the book. Okay. She asked her, are you going to turn me away now and not claim me as your daughter? And he, she's like, dolt, Becky snapped and gave an annoyed sigh. Of course I'm not. You are, you and I are family. I'm your mother, for heaven's sake. Remember I told you that there was money when I first visited you at the Triple M. Emmeline found a chair and sat down hard. I'd forgotten. Is it a great deal? Yes, Becky said, nodding briskly the, at the envelope which rested in Emmeline's wraps, lap. <laughs> Sorry. See for yourself. Handshaking, Emmeline opened the packet, drew out the papers, unfolded them, and took a few seconds to find her line marked balance and deposit. And when she did, she gasped aloud. It was a small fortune. Becky's smile was a welcome sight, even if it was a bit ironic. You're a wealthy woman now in your own right, Emmeline. Doesn't that surprise you? Yes, Emmeline burst out. I had no idea. I po can't possibly accept stuff and nonsense, Becky said, cutting her off. You will inherit three times that much when I pass away in this hotel into the bargain such as it is. Emmeline pressed one hand to her mouth and shook even her head in her wildest flight of fancy. She never even imagined having so much money with such wealth she could do anything she wanted to, travel to any part of the world, wear the finest clothes, and bedeck herself in any kind of jewelry she always coveted, and still have a fat balance in her bank account. The strange thing was... She would have given it all back, and gladly, every penny, every cent, every luxury, such riches afforded, if she could only be with Rafe. Back in the tenuous golden time before she shattered his image of her, she lowered her head and a great sob rising into her throat. Becky took her into her arms. There now, she said, we'll work this out somehow. I was trying to do the right thing, Emmeline wept. I know, Becky commiserated, I know. We move on. Page 384. You and Holt are good friends, she mused, watching Becky watch his departure. I don't think I realized that before. 
Yes, Becky said, meeting Emmeline's gaze and holding it without a flinching. We go way back, Holt and I do. We even shared a few business deals. He was looking for a housekeeper, Emmeline said. He doesn't need a good housekeeper, Br Becky said briskly. He needs a wife. With that, she dispensed the subject. Emmeline let out her breath. She expected to get over missing Rafe so much, but it was worse than ever. The milady seemed to grow keener and more painful with every passing day. Rather than better, as it should be, by rights, have done. Any word from Rafe? Becky asked gently, laying a comforting hand on Emmeline's forearm. I ask after him, Emmeline admitted. Holt said he was miserable, and just as stubborn as ever. I believe he thinks that if I go back to the Triple M to live, Rafe might get over his anger sooner. Becky took her by her shoulders and gave a slight shake. You love that man, don't you? Yes, Emmeline said wretchedly. Then go tell him, tell him so. The look in Becky's eyes was urgent. Oh, Emmeline, life is so short. If there's a chance in all of this world of making Rafe see. Emmeline shook her head again, looking not at Becky's face now, but looking out the dining room window to the street. John Lewis was passing by on the sidewalk, a bunch of wild flowers in his gun hand. A few moments later, both women heard the bell ring at the registration desk. Desk, go tell him, Emmeline said, kissing Becky's cool, careful, powered cheek. As you said, in life, very, life is very so short, and you mustn't waste a minute. Becky hesitated, then straightened her spine and on her, put on her most brilliant smile. Well, she said, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't take my own advice, now wouldn't I? With that, she strolled out of the lobby to greet her suitor warmly, while Emmeline stayed rooted to the spot for a long time, her eyes full of tears, smiling at her mother's hard-earned happiness. On page 387. You get got business in this town, or do I have to arrest you for loitering? Rafe had eyed the flowers that set it, set that and, and resetted his hat, just waiting for my horse to get shod. He said, "Thought you all did your blacksmith and ride on the ranch." Lewis replied with an eloquent glance toward the hotel. Once old John got a man on the hook, he didn't like to get him off easy. Why don't you go over there and just say hello to that bride of yours? Fetch her home like you oughta done weeks ago. Rafe's neck felt hot, and it seemed to swell, making him want to unbutton his collar and shove his coat pocket or toss it into the first alley he passed. What goes on between me and Emmeline is our business, and nobody else's. John's easy shrug made Rafe see red. Well, then have the dec decency to divorce her, won't you? This town is chock full of men looking to take a wife, and Miss Emmeline is a prime for the picking. Folks are already speculating on when she'll be back on the market. Rafe's right hand clenched into a fist much to his own accord, and but he consciously opened his fingers, much as he thought he'd knock on John Lewis into the nearest horse trough. He figured that he couldn't afford the indulgence. Punching an officer of the law was bound to be a crime, and he'd most likely end up behind bars for a good long while. It's amazing. They both are so full of pride, they can't forgive each other. Even over a simple mistake... A misunderstanding that takes communication to work things out. And if without that communication of saying, hey, look, I made a mistake, or hey, look, this happened, or hey, look, you know what? Love conquers all. Then it doesn't. And without two people working together, you can't conquer all. Page 394. Go away, Rafe. Emmeline said, go home to that triple M and don't come back here until you're ready to say you're sorry for treating me the way you did. He stared at her, furiously confounded. You want me to say I'm sorry? I didn't start all this. You've treated me unbottomably, she said. You burned down our house. You were ready to believe the worst about me, even after all we'd been to each other. By then, Rafe was struck dumb, and his color was cutting off his air. He tore it off and sent it sailing, and it landed in the upper part of the palm tree, dangling a like a half moon made of coleoid. I don't know what that is. He couldn't have uttered a sensible word for anything just then. Out! Emmeline said, pointing dramatically in the direction of the door. Just get out! Rafe had been thrown out of saloons before, and even a bathhouse once in Denver, but never a respectable hotel. He stood his ground, folded his arms, and wished to God he had knew what to say. 
He was saved by Becky's appearance. She swept down the stairway next to them in a cloud of perfume and gracious goodwill. Why, Rafe, she said, extending a hand, smiling for all the world to see as if they met at some fancy party. How wonderful to see you. She looked, hooked her arm through his and steered him away from Emmeline and across the lobby toward the dining room. How is Angus in conception? Has there been any word from your younger brother? With Emmeline, Rafe had thought, felt, though, as if he felt a whole apple stuck in his throat. But with Becky, he found like he could talk. Maybe it was just that he'd taken the hat off and that damnable cover. Your daughter or niece or whatever it is, he sputtered, letting out her, the, her polite questioning go hang, is one infuriating female. Becky laughed. Yes, she agreed. Isn't she wonderful? The stage carrier ambled in just then and covered the trail, d carrying a battered envelope in one hand. He touched his hat to Becky and addressed Rafe. Just the man I wanted to see, he said, smirking a, le a little. I got a letter for you. You got another bride on the way, Rafe? Frowning, Rafe stepped forward. He took the missive letter and re read the return address and was struck by a terrible premonition. The Happy Home Matrimonial Service. He tore open the envelope, unfolded the page, and shook his wrist. Dear Mr. McKettrick, it began, we are at the Happy Home Matrimonial Service. Regret to inform you. He found a chair and fell into it read the letter again and then once more just to be sure becky laid a hand on his shoulder she seemed worried and rightly so he looked if if he looked the way he felt right then rave she said quietly what is it he looked up at her there was a legal problem something about the proxy he managed becky frowned waiting rafe didn't know whether to shout for joy or break down and cry like an old woman emmeline and i he said and paused and swallowed hard. We aren't married after all. That's page 396. On page 416, you're not going to San Francisco to have my baby alone and that's final. She pulled him into the room. What are you talking about? She demanded in a whisper. Now that she was recovering from the shock of finding Rafe outside her door in the middle of the longest and most miserable night she'd ever spent, she had the most conscious of the listening ears. Rafe stood with his back toward the door. He was wearing work clothes, and he looked low. He'd been dragged behind a horse at least part of the way. He needed a bath, a shave, and he still looked like he ought to have a place on Mount Olympus. He was just so handsome. I was wrong. Now, right there, girls. I was wrong. That's all these three, that's all the three little words. You know, we love hearing I love you, but we love hearing those three words even more. I was wrong. He said, I was wrong about everything, Emmeline. I love you and I want to come, you to come home with me, marry me, and make it right and proper. She stared at him. Her heart was picking up speed with every beat. She couldn't allow herself false hopes, though the fall, when the reality caught up to her, would be too long and too hard. He thought she was pregnant. That's why he was declaring himself now after all this time, when he'd never done it before. You mentioned a child, she said carefully. There's no baby, Rafe. I don't care, he said, and he looked so anxious that he had to be speaking the truth. I don't care what went on in Kansas City, either. Nothing went on in Kansas City, she said fiercely. He gathered her into his arms. I love you, Emmeline, he repeated. She pulled back. Her head was clearing a little. What about that new bride you ordered? She wanted to know. His grin was boyish. I'm sure Kate or Jeb, that's two of his brothers, would be glad if she shows up at all. Emmeline, did you hear me what I said before? I love you. She let her forehead rest against his strong shoulder. And I love you, she admitted. Against my better judgment, Rafe McKettrick, I do love you. Then let's go home right now, tonight. There's something I want to show you. She laughed at him, and there were cheers of joy gathering in her eyes. Rafe, she said reasonably, we can leave in the morning. His grin turned into a blinding smile. You've changed your mind about San Francisco, then? For now, anyway, she said with a little shrug and a tilted smile. The hotel furniture can wait. Page 420. We want to get married, he paused, glanced uncertainly down at Emmeline. At least I do. Do you? She nodded and then frowned a little. There are a couple conditions. Rafe looked worried and none too patient. Emmeline, he said, we talked about this most of the night. What conditions? 
It was true. They had talked for hours in her seedy way station room. They'd agreed that they both wanted children as soon as possible, and that the three of them would be no more running away from a fight. Or that there were not three of them. There's two of them. That there would be no more running away from a fight. And for no lying, either by word or omission, and no secrets. I think that's the most best part of this book. But anyway, continuing on. She took his arm, pulled him aside. Reverend Devere, mustache quavering, watched the retreat of the five-dollar gold piece with longing. I want to help Becky at the hotel, she said. We, we uh, all want to go into business together. Rafe narrowed his eyes. What kind of business, he demanded. Emmeline supposed he could be forgiven for asking such a question given past history, but she was bitten incensed all the same. The hotel business, she huffed, folding her arms. I'm looking for a wife here, Emmeline, Rafe said carefully. Not somebody who passes through every once in a while like a circuit preacher. Emmeline linked her arm through his, shook her head, and looked back at him. I promise, she said sweetly, not to lapse in my wifely duties. That's going to have to be good enough. Suppose I refuse. The wedding's off, Emmeline said. She spoke lightly, but her heart had come to a lurching stop in her chest. He stared her down for a long moment, his expression unreadable, and then laughed. All right, he said. We're bound to butt heads a few times, but we'll figure something out. Good, she said, and then they stood tiptoe, kissed on the cheek. The concessions he made were enormous ones for him, proof to Emmeline that he truly loved her. Thank you, Rafe. He gestured toward the bleary-eyed Reverend Deer, still pining visibly for the five-dollar gold piece. Shall we get ourselves hitched, then, he asked? This time for real? This time for real, Emmeline? agreed and forever it isn't going to be easy you know rafe warned we're going to make a lot of mistakes she smiled are you trying to back out on me rafe mcketrick he kissed her nose not me he said they both turned and reverend dear and then the man repeated his such and pat process until he came up with a black book wetting his finger on the tip of his tongue he turned his delicate page until he found the place and he cleared his throat and began dearly beloved there is a little bit more but i want you to read yourself but this book gets a 20 from me it has so many characters and they are intertwined so delicately that it's a perfect read page turning barn burning should be house burning though and just outstanding a 20. Now, what am I reading next? Well, I'm glad you ask. It's called Cowboy Summer by Joanne Kennedy. I'm on page 72. And it's got the possibility of being a 20, which is, I haven't marked as many pages in it, but in this book, it's a little bit more complex. And what I mean by that, you'll have to stay tuned for that book review which isn't tonight by any means. So God bless one and all. Stay healthy, stay safe, and be well. God bless.